Thanks for listening to Other People's Flowers. If you'd like to have your work feature on the program, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. We hope you enjoy this episode. Courting by Robert Davies It is all so easy now. Endless solipsism at the touch of a few keystrokes. Endless solipsism. An endless courting. Yes, I, a virginal, unaccomplished, unimpressive pianist born to a generation of Twitterati-loving, celebrity-loving, Facebook-screaming halfwits, could finally use the internet to find my perfect match. I'm a fun-loving, easy-going, relaxed kind of guy. I like socialising. Got to make sure everyone knows you love to go out. Reading, intellectual side. Music and art, cultured. And cooking, subtlety. I'm looking for a gal, funny Americanism, who's easygoing, doesn't take herself too seriously, and is looking for adventures around London. Cool way to say you want to walk around the city without actually paying for anything. For photos, I uploaded a couple of myself looking faintly serious. One of me wearing dark glasses, sitting back on holiday in Italy. I think it was. Looking like a jet setter. Another of me posing with friends. Got to show them that you've got friends. I selected a few further tags to describe myself. Relaxed, chilled out, cosmopolitan, artistic. And uploaded my profile. This particular online courting service cost £15 a month, so I was hoping for some serious results. The previous ones I used have been free, and the free dating sites really are not dating sites at all. They just try and meet someone who wants sex and is as desperate as you. Inevitably, they are crawling with men. After all my previous failures, I wanted a site that made it easy to match me with the woman of my dreams. Was my lonely soulmate really using fate.com to seek out a future husband? My perfect woman was bookish, probably a librarian. Plain looking on the surface, but absolutely stunning when she made an effort. Musical, intelligent, not too self-righteous, unassuming and having no expectations in the bedroom. This last point was the most crucial, as all the simulated sex I got from porn left me a dead fish in the bedroom. As far as I could tell, all the amazing rampant sex people were having was just a fantasy. If you're not going to have sex like they do on the internet, there's not really much point. A couple of hours, six, sun rising, moon falling, whole week vanishing. And finally I got some matches, or fates as fate.com called them. Evidently, Fate.com assumed it knew me better than I knew myself, as my initial matches were only with men. I checked my Interested In tab again, definitely selected I am a man seeking a woman. I was tempted to call up Fate.com and complain. After all, I was paying good money to be represented by their service, and the least they could do would be to match my selections. But then wasn't it a little desperate to call up Fate.com and demand an explanation? Wouldn't the account manager in charge of my account be secretly laughing at me while I explain my predicament? No, I would have to sit it out and hope that everything got fixed in a couple of days. Perhaps I could tweet about it to my 120 followers, quite a societal influence, and demand fate.com refund me. But this humiliation would be even greater. My followers would surely lose all respect of me. Ten more days and the recommendation engine managed to fix itself. Finally, I was matched with real-life women. At least I assume they were real life, as internet anonymity prevented me from knowing for certain. Karen, Lucy, Annabelle, Katie, Rachel, Sarah, and Imogen. A boundless cornucopia. In the real world, I would never be deemed attractive enough, certainly not. If this were a late night bar situation on a Friday night, I would have gone home lonely three or four hours ago. But here, in my inbox, were seven reasonably attractive women, all fated to fall in love with me. Oh, the joys of being who you want to be online. I messaged all of them, a simple, brief, illuminative message about the kind of guy I am, the kind of guy I want to be, and why they should want to hang out with me. It turned out two of them did not want to hang out, despite our perfect match. I got no reply. But never mind, Katie and Rachel might be out, but I still had five to give me hope. Two more were out by the end of the day, and one more, Lucy, responded in the middle of the night, telling me I really wasn't her thing, whatever that means. So within a day, I was down to the final two potential mates, Imogen and Karen. Staring at Imogen's profile, I struggled to find something witty to write to her. My previous messages had been about their interests. Oh, I see you like art galleries. Me too. I'm a fan of cooking as well. I love cycling. Long been my ambition to climb Mount Everest. 
Unfortunately, chatting to women online is as difficult as chatting to them in the real world. My messages were too predictable, too dull. People filled out their interests because they had to, not because they wanted to. For Imogen and Karen, I would need to do something profound, something unpredictable, something dangerous. As a desperate, sad student, I'd read that famous book that has now become testament for uncool men, The Game. From it, I glean that all women really want is a man who dresses like an idiot and is unrelentingly unpleasant to. Tell them they smell, said The Game, and find yourself sleeping with the most attractive woman in the room. Despite this misogynistic tripe, the game apparently bred a whole generation of pseudo-players who slept with whoever they wanted, whenever they wanted. Oh, how I wished I could be one of those suave losers, getting whichever woman he wants whenever he wants her. I wouldn't have to sit in front of my computer desperately hoping one of my fake.com matches will see through my absurd profile and see the nice guy I am. The guy who'll love them and cherish them and care for them better than any dickhead dressed in flares and a velvet shirt. But no. Life is unfair, especially in matters of dating. So I wrote two shameful messages to Imogen and Karen, essentially telling them that I lacked all respect for them, loathed women and wanted nothing more than to bang them, along the lines of, Dear, insert name here, you look so fit in your profile pic. Are your tits real? I would love so much to take you out sometimes because I think you really smell. I'm paraphrasing, but that about sums up the gist of it. Amazingly, I got two responses within the hour, one from Karen of utter moral outrage, telling me that she didn't smell, her breasts were real, and there was no way in hell she would consider meeting up with me. She was so outraged she was tempted to file a complaint with fate.com so that I'd be removed and never allowed to find my fated love. A bit harsh, but probably fair. Being online is all about making friends and connecting, excusing anonymous commenting, and I completely ruined that by making a heinous pass at her. But there was nothing to panic about. I still had Imogen. Imogen wrote to me to tell me I sounded interesting and she wanted to get to know me more. Getting to know someone online is the most banal invention known to humankind. A few platitudes, a couple of compliments, a generic discussion about shared interests, a chat about politics or some other more ethereal subject to show each other how intelligent you are. Imogen was slow to respond, and sitting in my flat in Holland Park, I found myself staring out of the window at the greying sky, at the concrete building's green blanketed park, as I waited for her to respond. Our conversation went something like this. Strange message you sent. Slightly pervy, but then kind of funny as well. Sorry. I didn't know what else to say. I've tried everything with the other girls and got no responses. Other girls? Other fates. Oh, cool. So you like theatre? Yes. The above response took one hour to come through. What do you like? All sorts. Musicals, plays, monologues, whatevers. I like theatre. Nothing from her for half an hour. That's cool. We should go to the theatre sometime. Absolute silence for an hour and me absolutely desperate. Maybe I loathe the word. Well, how about next Saturday? There's a production of Endgame I've been wanting to see. What's Endgame? Couldn't make the effort to look it up. It's a play. A play by who? By Samuel Beckett. Who's Samuel Beckett? And on and on, ad infinitum, until I was convinced Imogen had lied about her theatre interest just to make herself sound more cultural. Not only did she have no idea who Beckett was, she also didn't know Strindberg, Ibsen or Schiller. Who did she know? Andrew Lloyd Webber, and the writers of Les Mis, which I'm sure she would have pronounced Les Mis had she not been chatting over the internet. Instead of the production of Endgame, we decided to meet up around Bloomsbury and spend some time strolling around and getting to know each other. I spent a frantic week freaking out and hoping that everything would go smoothly. Imogen would be the furthest I'd ever got with an online woman. Real-life women had been disastrous. A couple of hopeless attempts at university that had resulted in me wondering if I was ever going to fall in love. Deep down, I am a romantic. A new romantic. The borders of love have been shifted. The romantic hero no longer acts boldly in front of his lover to woo her. That might be construed as sexual assault. The romantic hero no longer dominantly grabs his mole and kisses her as an orange sunset fades behind them. No, the romantic hero now stays at home and waits patiently at his computer for permission permission to venture forth into the great unknown. 
I skipped down to Bloomsbury, ignored the sweaty tube, and stood in Great Ormond Street with the summer air brushing over me. The trees swished in the wind, the pavement shone. A window cleaner cleaned nearby shop fronts, and my beau strolled towards me like a scene from My Fair Lady. Only the first woman I'd assumed was Imogen was not actually her. I stepped off the tree I was leaning on to greet her, and was greeted by the cold stare of a woman who saw a fauteur approaching her. Imogen arrived a few moments later. Hello, I said, casual as I could be. Hey. I went close to her, preparing to kiss her on the cheek, but when I was a few inches away from her, she stuck her hand out. Too late. I'd leaned in to try and kiss her, and she leaned back to avoid my leching, and I was forced to pretend nothing had happened and just shake her hand. Nice to meet you, I said. And you. Immy had clearly photoshopped her photo on Fate.com. I'd been expecting a buxom, deliciously bodied blonde and had instead received a frumpy, arty-looking lady whose hair was greasy and unwashed. She did have nice eyes, though, and lips and a fabulous neck. She was clearly disappointed in me as well. I have to confess, I had photoshopped my photo. While I didn't go as far as giving myself a six-pack where there was none, I did remove a couple of blemishes on my skin, raise my shoulders and flatten my paunch. But hey, the internet's not for honesty. So what are we going to do? she asked. I don't know. I thought we could just wander around. Could we not? I've got a slightly sore bum. I wasn't sure if this was a joke or not, so assumed it was best to ignore it. After all, If I started mentioning her bottom in the obsessive way I was prone to do, she might think I was yet another misogynist, and I was eager to show that I was not, that I loved women, that I adored them, that I craved them. Poor you. Thanks. So maybe we should go to a wine bar or a pub or something, or whatever. I'm an alcoholic. Oh. A cafe, then. Great. We strolled to the Brunswick and ended up sitting in Starbucks. She seemed completely at ease, having told me she was an alcoholic. People are much better at sharing these days. To my surprise, she brought two muffins, a smoothie and a mocha. There had been nothing about a fondness for sugar on her Fate.com profile. The chocolate chips and glaze shone in the sunlight as she picked at the first muffin. The tips of her fingers turned chocolate brown and she licked them with delight when she'd finished. Then came the second muffin. A lemon drizzle and poppy seed number, which she slowly tore to pieces, melting sugar shining on her hands before eating. Sorry, she said. I'm pretty hungry. No problem. So you like theatre? Yes. What else do you like? Oh, you know, all sorts of things. A pause. Such as? Such as reading, films, socialising, tennis, cycling, cooking, spending time with friends. It sounded like a list of school child hobbies, but she seemed not to notice. I love cooking. I'm a bit of a foodie, if I'm honest. I love going to markets and tasting all the delicious things they have on offer. I live in Hackney, and there's so many cool markets there. I love it. I used to go every weekend. Delightful. Are you a foodie? With no enthusiasm, I replied that I wasn't. Not because I'm not, but because I'm not clear on exactly what a foodie is. Presumably it's someone who eats a lot. I eat. Everyone eats. But foodies seem to eat with a greater sense of purpose than anyone else. I used to be a cook, she continued. That's probably where I get it from. I worked in the Mandarin Oriental. But it was too exhausting, so I had to give it up. We worked 14 to 16 hours a day. I was tired all the time. I decided I wasn't living the life I wanted to live. It's fine to work all the time, but you've got to have something more. Sure. She slurped her smoothie. I had finished my black coffee long ago. What do you do? I'm a systems analyst. What's that? With great reluctance, I explained to her exactly what a systems analyst was. Her eyes turned hollow and disinterested as soon as I began. I probably should have lied and told her that I too was a chef. That's cool, was all she managed when I'd finished. Cool, indeed. When she'd finished her meal, I wasn't sure what to offer next. Was this the point you propositioned them? The online dating form is very difficult to understand. Do you go about sleeping with them on the first date? Is that going too far? Are you just going to be friends? How do you make sure you're not just friends with them? We sat in silence for a few moments while she waited for me to suggest something. Would you like to stroll around? Okay. 
We began walking down Marchmont Street in the direction of Euston Road. A fluorescent cyclist passed us, mother and child, a couple of students. You're a good listener, she said. This seemed like the sort of compliment you gave a younger brother or gay best friend. I did not want to be associated with being a good listener. So I turned away and stared at the red awning of a house across the road to pretend I wasn't listening. It's difficult to find good listeners. Still, I stared across the street. I've been looking for a listener for such a long time. With a crab-like walk, she steered herself towards me on the pavement, our shoulders touch. Oh no, I thought, she thinks I'm gay, and I'm her gay best friend. She's going to suggest we go shopping together. Immediately, I was angry at Fate.com for not making it explicitly clear to members that it was not a friendship site. If you want to make friends, go elsewhere. No, no, no. Fate.com was all about romance. Romance and ultimately sex. Two things I wanted so desperately. And yet, here I was, girl on the shoulder, talking about how to make the perfect casserole, treating me like I'd known her for years. I needed to say something outrageous, I thought, something only a red-blooded, randy, raucous male would say. Something to let her know that I was not friend material, that I was masculinity epitomised. I love this part of London, she said. We'd crossed Euston Road at this point, and were heading up towards Camden. There's a farmer's market here every third Sunday of the month. It's one of the best in town. I often head down here to get some things. I don't care. Her shoulder drew away from mine, and a gulf grew between us. What? I should have said nothing, but it was too late. I was committed to being an arsehole. I said I don't care. What? I don't care about you or your farmer's markets. Maybe you should spend less time cooking anyway, if you know what I mean. Who was this horrible person spouting insults at the poor sweet girl? I certainly didn't know him. What? I said, I think you should spend less time cooking if you know what I mean. No, I don't know what you mean. Psh! She stopped, and I continued walking. Now I was acting like I'd read the game. Now I was acting like the strutting seducer. I turned back to look at her. She'd stopped and was leaning against a lamppost. Her chest was heaving, breath shortened, legs weakening. I certainly had a powerful effect on women with my biting comments. Leonine, majestic, the boastful conqueror. Also slightly ashamed of myself, I turned back and prepared to continue walking. She let out a small squawk, and by the time I'd turned around, was on the ground rolling around, having some kind of seizure. Oh no, I said, forgetting my intention to be a swaggering, unsympathetic alpha male. Is everything okay? Her mouth frothed, saliva boiled in her lips, her eyes were red bloodshot. Her whole face turned purple, body stiffened, arms flailed helplessly a couple of times. Oh, fuck. Desperately, I sought my phone in my pocket, fumbled it onto the ground, grasped around for it on the pavement, eyes filled with light, panic, pure panic. Then sirens, flashing sirens, and an ambulance was there, and she was being lifted onto the back of it. Another hero, not me, had stepped in and called the ambulance as soon as the fit occurred and I had been left to bumble around helplessly trying to save my first date. Are you her partner? The paramedic said. Uh, yes. Yes. Good move. Getting in there when she couldn't protest. I rode with her to the hospital. The paramedics gave her some drug, put some breathing apparatus over her nose and mouth, and soon she was sleeping calmly. It didn't seem like she needed to go to the hospital when we got there. They stretched her out and told me to wait in A&E. Depressed, sick, helpless faces, staring at the floor, the wall, or watching other people traipse in and out. This was crisis point for me. What if she told them that I'd caused the fit by following the advice of the game? A policeman entered, swaggering an official, and spoke to the receptionist. He gazed in my direction. Not at me, but around me, and I stopped breathing. I couldn't get a criminal record. I just couldn't. I know it was a stupid thing to do, but how was I supposed to know she'd have a fit? Had I, through my bravara, pushed her over the edge? Or was she going to have a fit anyway? She could have told me she was an epileptic. Why would you not tell someone you might collapse and start convulsing at any moment? That's important information. I need to know that for our future life together. Maybe there was something special I should have done, given her special medicine, CPR, forced a wooden stick between her teeth, grabbed her head and shaken her back to reality. A doe-eyed young girl, perhaps fifteen, sat next to her father and stared at me. Her father caught me looking back and I looked away. 
great. Nye was an assumed pervert, as well as a girlfriend murderer. The fluorescent, body-armoured policeman was sure to arrest me at any moment. Turning from the desk, he walked towards me, heavy boots squeaking on the shining vinyl floor, staring at me as he came, me looking in every direction other than straight ahead. Sat down next to me, crisis averted. He took his helmet off and clutched it in his lap. I was spared. I was safe. Hours later, four or five, my sweet-natured epilepsy victim emerged, doped up and drowsy. I stood up and went towards her, arms slightly outstretched in case she toppled into me. She looked at me with a vacant stare and turned towards the exit. She was so out of it, she had no idea who I was. Before I could react, the automatic doors had hissed open and she was out in the street. Having been ignored, I wasn't sure if it was wise to follow her out. A room full of people had just witnessed me being spurned by her. They would think it very strange if I now followed her out. And the policeman was still there, eyes on my back, preparing for me, the predator, the pervert, to strike. And the father with his pretty daughter. Yes, every eye was watching me, ready to squeal, cry wolf. But then I was already standing near the exit. I could hardly turn back now. One step, two steps, and I was out the door, heart pumping, chest heaving, looking around for my beau, who no longer knew me. She was strolling down the winding concrete steps that led to street level. From a distance, she was a zombie. No, more like a commuter, locked in the solipsism of their preferred electronic device, ignoring everything but the beat in their ears, somehow functioning without any thought. She reached the bottom of the spiral staircase and began out towards the street. I rushed after her, not for a second wondering why I was still following, why I hadn't long abandoned any hope of romance and gone home to look for more happy women on fate.com. I clattered down the concrete steps, almost tripped up on the pavement's edge, rushed past the screaming ambulance that was just emerging from the car park, and reached the bus stop. Imogen was sitting, her head leant back against the glass, eyes glazed, a gentle smile on her face. A young couple were doting over each other next to her, I daren't enter the bus stop. I lingered just next to the glass, watching the whole scene, hoping, desperately hoping that none of them would notice. Pig-tailed, lackadaisical, fanciful, the girl being smooched by her lover chanced to stare at me. But it was okay. I looked through her to the ground with my practice commuter's indifference. The 56 bus to Hackney came and dopey Imogen dragged herself aboard. The couple followed, then me. Imogen sat right at the back, indifferent, and I positioned myself a couple of rows in front so I could see her leave. The bus journey lasted forever. Grey buildings, the glorious sparkling river, more grey buildings, bright glass. And finally the bus reached its terminus and Imogen heaved herself off and out into the street. I had no idea where we were, but I followed. She walked down the street like a miner after a hard day in the depths, each step an effort. The light painful. Adjustment to the diurnal world, a terrible nightmare, and I kept a distance of 30 yards between us, checking around every so often to make sure we weren't being followed. We reached a dull residential street, red-bricked Edwardian houses on each side, black plastic bins in the street, a couple of for sale signs, slate roofs, sash windows. She stopped and hovered outside one. What was I to do now? Imogen, uh, Immy, Im, Jen, I spluttered. And then the dopey eyes were on me, summing me up, trying to understand who this pervert was standing in her street. Oh, hey, she said as if we were old friends. I didn't expect to see you here. I went with you to the hospital, striding towards her. Hospital? Oh, yeah, the hospital. That was fun. She looked at the front door of her house and back at me. Anyway, I've got to go in. Oh, well... I just wanted to make sure you're okay. Yeah, I'm great. Did she even know who I was? I doubted it. Maybe I'd send her a message on fate.com as soon as I got home. It was so much easier communicating through a screen. Anything else? She sighed. Um, no, uh, no. Okay, great. Well, I guess I'll see you soon. And that was it. She walked up the steps to her house, opened and closed the door, and left me to stare at the black paint. The last embers of the day were dying out to the west. A few clouds, white and grey, washed over the blue. 
I went home and wondered how I'd managed to make such a mess of things. But never mind. More fates awaited me. Other People's Flowers was produced by Hugo Gibson, Chris Kamon Vutitam, and Hamish Adam Kans. If you'd like to have your work feature on the show, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. Thank you for listening.